I only have two regrets. I didn't shoot Henry Clay, and I didn't hang John C. Calhoun. One of the, uh, the more infamous quotes from President Andrew Jackson, uh, when asked about his regrets of his presidency, and I, I thought that was a good jumping off point for today's episode, where we are going to look into the nullification crisis, uh, some of the victories over internal improvements and further uh, you know, deconstructing Clay's beloved American system. And to dive into this and more, I am joined, as always, by Dr. Patrick Newman, author of Cronyism, Liberty and Power, Liberty versus Power in America. You can get a discount at the Mises store with the coupon code LVP. So now that we have shielded the book once again, Patrick, what, what should we be thinking about going into the successes of the Jacksonian Revolution outside of the big one, the war against the bank? Um, you know, what do you find interesting about uh, you know this this particular period when it comes to some of the other accomplishments of this era? So the the Jacksonians, as we've discussed, and as you you mentioned again, the Jacksonians are most famous for uh, getting rid of the Second Bank of the United States. Uh, but they've also had many other notable accomplishments when it came to dismantling Henry Clay's American system of uh, protective tariffs, internal improvements, and central banking. So. They basically got rid of not only the central bank uh, plank of the American system, but they also got rid of the other two planks. The Jacksonians, through Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, John Tyler, who's kind of an ex-Jacksonian, but he's still a Jacksonian at heart, and James K. Polk, uh, these four presidential uh, administrations, the Jacksonians instituted the independent treasury. They got rid of protective tariffs. They instituted relative free trade tariffs, and they also downsized the government spending. Uh, they reduced federal involvement with internal improvements. They promoted a general incorporation laws on the state level, and they reduced the public debt. So when it comes to the American system, at least those the, the economic policy of the American system, the Jacksonians, they were a stunning success. It took them a couple presidential administrations, but unlike the Jeffersonians, the Jacksonians did succeed in reducing cronyism and implementing many reform policies. And, and you know, I think emphasizing that, you know, when we talk, think about you know, Jacksonian policy, it, it really does transcend Jackson, the man we've talked about, obviously, some of the other leading figures. But, you know, we're also talking about the presidencies of Martin Van Buren, uh, a Polk later on and, and some of these other figures. But but also, you know, there is and we've touched on this in some of the past episodes, but I want to kind of dive deeper into it now. You know, this is something that is not simply an American phenomenon. This is something that's happening through the Anglo sphere. Um, it's also interesting because at the same time, right, you know, you, you, we've we've had uh, you know, the, the Napoleonic Wars within Europe, right? You know, th there's a lot of stuff going on within the European continent itself. And, and there's also sort of, sort of this broadening in terms of intellectual divisions between the thought in the Anglosphere and the European continent. And particularly when it comes to the economic side of things, you know, Adam Smith's political consequences continue to go on uh, alongside the American battles with you know, some of these things going on on the tariff side of things, this, this coincides with pounding on the tables within uh, England, uh, you know, moving against the corn laws that came about in the, the 1815s. Um, and and you know, so you know, when you get into the 1830s and the, and the 1840s, there is a very populist attack on protectionist tariffs, on... Uh, uh, government privileges for for you know special uh, uh, industries, right? And and so, can you just touch upon you know let's let's go down in that that transatlantic persuasion rabbit hole on the way that the successes of the Jacksonians also have influenced uh, political trends within England and Canada, and and as part of again a, a very much a pivot. You know, when we think about liberalism within the Anglo sense, it really much you know, it, it really was uh, focused on a lot of this economic policies. Rather than you know some of the attacks on religion that you know you know kind of highlight some of the French aspects and you know th this is a very specific Anglo liberal uh, tradition that the Jacksonians are very much a part of. Yeah, so the America at this time, I'm glad you brought this up because America at this time, when we think of Americans, many of them came from England. They came from Great Britain. It was primarily immigration at this time period was 
it was it was obviously not only white, but it was again, it mainly came from Europe, and really when it in Europe, it came from uh, the British Isles. Uh, you, you only started to see other immigration Germans kind of in the 1850s, and then Italians and so on later. So America is populated by uh, the by by British. It's it's WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So many of the ideas of England are going to reverberate and influence people in America. We've discussed on this podcast how the ideas of Adam Smith and his followers influenced Jeffersonian Republicans, uh, such as Albert Gallatin and so on. This trend continued in the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s with new economists rising through the ranks. Some of these are uh, the devoted Smithians, Again, we can we can look more at their actual doctrinal affiliation, you know, as Rothbard does. But guys like John Baptiste say uh, said they were Smithian, and so that influenced Americans um, in that regard. Um, when we got our our economic thought, we, it was, was influenced by British thought because economics was still the economic science was still very based in Europe, in particular Great Britain. At least that's the you know the traditional narrative of uh, you know the, the classical economics. It was it was it was Britain that was ruling the day. Guys like David Ricardo, and then later on John Stuart Mill, etc. So. The, the the British ideas of, of 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 the free market of laissez faire et cetera those influenced the Jacksonians and of course Jacksonian ideas also influenced the British. One of the reasons why I argue that the Jacksonians were successful uh, when uh, the Jeffersonians were not, and really why the Jacksonians were the most successful libertarian anti crony reform movement we've seen in American history, is because of this neglected tag team effort with the British, you could say. So the Jacksonians were able to mount an assault on the banking system because the British were also mounting an assault on the banking system. The Jacksonians were able to mount an assault on protective tariffs because the British were mounting an assault on protective tariffs. And that allowed Jacksonians to diffuse protectionists who often use the argument, why should we lower our tariffs if other countries aren't lowering their tariffs, right? But instead you have this quite really reciprocal trade uh, re reduction in trade barriers, which is a very powerful um, uh, motivation encouraging people to support free trade in America. So the Jacksonians were really working informally with British reformers at this time period. They shared ideas, they shared strategy, they shared tactics, et cetera. And this is what allowed the Jacksonians to be successful. I mean, in a modern sense, we're looking at this as similar sort of tag team effort um, though, you know, of course, the, 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 the things have changed and it's not uh, Jacksonian laissez-faire politics per se, but it, the, 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 there's, there's no surprise, I don't think, or no coincidence that Brexit was voted on the same year as Trump won election. So you, you saw, in a sense, like a, this reemergence of this um, informal, uh, you know, this, this Jacksonian British alliance. Again, sometimes there are economies of scale. So you want a movement uh, for laissez-faire, not just in America, but also around the world. And in, in, in for the around the world to the United States, that was Great Britain. I kind of like the idea of uh, Cambridge Analytica, which was the group that Steve Bannon worked with for both the Brexit and the Trump campaigns. It became a scandalous sort of thing later on because that's what the media does. The idea of that as kind of a modern day version of the transatlantic persuasion, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, but it, it's also just interesting to think about when you, when you consider, you take a step back, I mean, here you have a president who, you know, he becomes a national rock star precisely because of, of killing British <laughs> soldiers, right? Like, it, it is a fascinating development here where, again, like the Jeffersonians were very French aligned. And then here you have, again, Andrew Jackson leading this pivot to the Anglosphere. Again, it just, just not that far disconnected from, obviously, Wars of Independence and War of 1812. I mean, it's just a very fascinating dynamic here. Yeah, oh, ab absolutely. I mean, because the, the Jacksonian movement not only includes Jackson, obviously includes many of his of, of his of his followers. Uh, but yeah, you still see it's it's an, it's a little bit of an interesting dynamic. Uh, really, after the War of 1812, though, there were flare ups. 
uh, regarding you know border disputes with Canada uh, or even issues regarding the West Coast and then potentially Texas. Um, Americans, we came to see the British more and more as allies and not as enemies, right? Clearly, the British, uh, from an average American's perspective, was the big bad guy uh, from the Revolutionary War to the War of 1812. But after that, there were fits, but this is the beginning of this uh, American, uh, Anglo-American alliance. And a big reason behind this, and this is why um, the 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 um, protective tariffs, when we institute protective tariffs, we weaken that alliance is because of free trade. We realize it's mutually beneficial. We can engage in trading arrangements uh, and so on. But so, yeah, you, you uh, from the, the support for a American British alliance, sort of informal alliance, is coalescing around a man who was famous for fighting the British. But that's just the way history goes sometimes. And I think it's also interesting the, the similarities, but also some of the minor differences in the way that the Jacksonians formed, uh, you know, kind of argued their laissez faire policies, you know, from a, a perspective kind of. I know uh, Robert Kelly highlights how you know, the Jacksonians saw around them a conspiracy of clever men who lived by their wits profiting from the toil of those who live by the sweat of their brow. You know, there's this concept, you know, of, of that the Hamiltonian banker, um, you know, in, in similar today, right, where you have the railing against the financial elites and the vulture capitalists, like Tucker Carlson likes to talk about, right? You know, th this is kind of baked into the DNA that, you know, you, you have these hardworking Americans um, that, that, you know, there's also this dynamic at play where the ability of, of going from, you know, you're being born into a family of the lowest of the low, you know, with with a lot of you know with, with some personal ingenuity and and success, you could catapult yourself into the elites of society. You know, there, there's that dynamic going on where you know it it, it is this, this very interesting change in social conditions. Um, but so the Jacksonians were very much focused on the ways which these government policies were rewarding uh, people not based off of merit but off of political uh, pull. Whereas, you know, some of the differences and, and kind of you know, they're, they're nuanced, but uh, I know like Robert Peel and, and or, uh, uh, yeah, Peel and, and some of the other leaders in the liberals in, in uh, England were kind of railing against, you know, the, the landed aristocracy. So something even more, you know, a, a, you know more of that sort of, of you know, product of birth, uh, uh, you know, advantage, you know, that, that you know, there's, there's a little bit of differences there going, you know, to, I think, the, the the differences of America being a pro being a product of kind of you know something different from that ancient regime, right? That uh, you know, that 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 kind of marks you know old Europe uh, and differing to the to the colonies, right? And and that there's some of the differences there, though. Ultimately, though, these are all in the sort of class driven narratives um, to motivate uh, organization that leads to political reform. And I know we were having this conversation off air. That's one of the things that I you know there, there's one uh, quote from Mises. That that I I think um, a lot of this pushes back too, and, and this is why I think it's so important to understand this era uh, within liberalism. Uh, you know, Mises remarks. Uh, I think it's the end of the chapter called "The Future of Liberalism," and, and it's, it's not a very optimistic thing. Um, but but he ends this chapter with uh, no sect and no political party has believed that it could afford to it, it could afford to forego advancing in cause by appealing to men's senses. Rhetorical bombast, music and song resound, banners wave, flower, flowers and colors serve as symbols, and the leaders seek to attach their followers to their own person, you know, personality cults. Liberalism has nothing to do with all of this. It has no party flower and no party color, no party song and no party idols, no symbol and no slogans. It has the substance of the arguments. These must lead it to victory. And, and while I appreciate it from like the Mississippian perspective, that ultimately there is no substitute for good ideas that lead to policies and, and the shaping of society that promote, you know, better material well-being, all these things that we like. Ultimately, though, I look at the Jacksonian era and I see the fact that you had success with laissez-faire economics wrapped up in party, wrapped up in personality cult in the form of Andrew Jackson, you know, wrapped up in, you know, the, these partisan newspaper outlets that become the second handlers of ideas, you know, trans, you know, creating these, these, these products that transmit the ideas of Smith and Ricardo in the good way, um, and into, you know, normal conversation. And, and that, you know, it, it was a, a working class fighting back against the elite mentality here. 
A lot of that had to do with the success of turning these liberal ideas into popular political products. And, and so I, I think that, you know, there, there is something to be said about all, you know, it's, it's easy to roll our eyes at, at the, the silliness of uh, mo most vulgar politics. But here's an example of it actually being put into practice. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, that is something that you could definitely push back on Mises on. And I think even later, sort of his career, now he wouldn't, he wasn't involved in the actual campaigning, but, you know, he did do political work, at least, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the Vienna Chamber of Commerce and, and some other things, uh, again, pushing for policy. Economists can't remain in their high tower. They have to actually try and communicate these ideas to people. And many economists back in the day, both American and classical and Austrian, they were always involved in some sort of uh, p politics or, or, or some sort of government service. Uh, Turgot was economic minister of France. Uh, Adam Smith, he was a customs commissioner. Uh, John Baptiste Say was a member of the French legislature. David Ricardo, he was a member of the British Parliament. Karl Menger, tutor to Crown Prince Rudolf, and then Bamba Verk, he was the Austrian Minister of Finance. Uh, a lot of these guys, they were involved in government policy, doing work related to actually trying to bring about uh, anti-crony reforms, you could say. And yeah, this is this is a very important point that it's not just the bureaucrat or the government politician that can actually get stuff done. You have to communicate it to the people. And this is something that I think Rothbard understood better than Mises, but it's the importance of political parties and campaigning. Now, again, it's still a sticky situation. Doesn't mean you're still going to get a lot of stuff done, especially in the modern era, but it is something that can't be denied. You have to find some way of energizing people to be interested in these ideas. Your average person back then and now doesn't have the time to read economic tomes or even economic articles. Some people, what most they're going to do is they might read a couple headlines a week and that's it. Uh, so for those people, of course, we can leave the books and all of that stuff to other people, uh, you know, academics, more learned laymen, et cetera. But for your average person, you got to find some way of communicating problems to them. You got to find some way of making inflation, debt, tariffs, uh, interesting to them. And so they're going to remember slogans. They're going to remember, okay, I'm going to vote Democrat because being a Democrat means free trade, uh, or I'm going to vote Whig because being a Whig means protective tariff and so on. You have to actually find a way of hammering points home to people. And a lot of people back in the day, they used sort of quasi social media to get that done short clips and you know newspapers or political cartoons that appealed to people who couldn't even read english so instead they just see the cartoons and they see big fat guys with bags of money and they realize okay that person's a problem and you know, thinking of uh thomas nast and boss tweet etc so yeah you have to find some way of actually packaging the economic ideas into a political platform that masses are going to be able to understand and agree with. And this is something that I think the Jacksonians did really well. And you've got a lot of lesser known Jacksonians, William Googe, Amos Kendall, Francis Preston Blair, uh, William Leggett, William Colin Bryant. These guys were these guys were the tweeters of the day. They were writing newspaper articles. They were editors of newspapers. They were writing policy reports, etc. They all most of them, they all got their hands dirty and they were participating in politics, uh, you know, working in a caucus or even running for office or something like that. Uh, again, this is this is this is just how politics was back then and political economy was back then, as well as even now. Let's not forget John Taylor, uh, really our nation's first kind of economist. He also served in the uh, he also was a senator from Virginia a couple of times. So. You know, that, 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 that point bears emphasis. Yeah, there's a, a Ryan McMakin quote that I've become fond of that, you know, we study economics to learn how we're getting, how we're being ripped off. And I think that is important. He's, also, he's got a great series on, on this particular period of history as well. Um, and, and, and defensive Mises, though, and, and, and actually, I think you do, you, you touched on a little bit where there was, might have been some evolution of thought there. You know, he, he wrote liberalism originally in 1927. You know, it was when he was in Austria, and as mentioned before, there is a little bit of a big difference there, talking about the Anglosphere and the continent 
and, and the way perspectives on, on some of this changed, you know, by the time he was working with Fee and, and the National Association of Manufacturers and the old, you know, the, the old right that was opposing the New Deal stuff, you know, there might have been a, a little bit of a change there. And, and, and certainly uh, uh, Murray Rothbard uh, you know, recognized the importance of populism as a, uh, as a weapon for uh, good economics. Um, the, the stuff about uh, a legate, though, like in those sort of groups, um, one of my favorite parts about uh, Gore Vidal's Burr is that kind of the framing device is William Leggett is uh, encouraging the uh, the narrator of the book to uh, uh, find out some dirt about uh, Martin Van Buren because they want to promote someone else to to follow up uh, Jefferson or uh, Jackson, and so it kind of goes into like you know what it was like really like to be like a newspaper boss where he had these very lofty ideas, but also kind of have to reconcile that with the dirty politics of the day, and it's just a, it's a very fascinating dynamic going on there. Uh, but, but speaking of the dirty politics of the day. Um, and, and some of the uh, uh, you know, interesting dynamics uh, and, and battles that were going on on some of these issues in practice. Um, you know, one of the splits within uh, you know, this, this era is you have a, a breakdown of relations between uh, Andrew Jackson and John Calhoun. Um, Calhoun, who was this very, you know, was, was a character who was really good at kind of uh, uh, remaking himself in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, what I think is interesting is that one of the big, I believe it might've been the big reason for the split, um, in spite of there being other things that Calhoun did in the past that perhaps would have other further, uh, uh, uh split him and, and Jackson as well. Um, you know, there, there's an, an issue with a woman named, uh, Peggy Eaton, who was the wife of a deep, of a dear friend of Andrew Jackson, who, uh, was accused of adultery very much in the same way that Andrew Jackson's beloved wife was. And, and you know, there, there's a dynamic there where Jackson sees in Peggy Eaton, who plays a very big role in his social circles, some parallels with his, you know, the, the wife that ended up dying shortly after his election. And Calhoun and his wife didn't want to socialize with the Eatons. And, and this leads, this little personal splat leads to a, a lot of big, uh, it leads to a divide that has a, ends up having a lot of ramifications in some of these other issues. Uh, is there anything that we need to know about the Peggy Eaton affair um, before I kind of dive into Calhoun and the nullification crisis? Um, it's a good question. I, I, I read about the Peggy Eaton affair, usually plays into, plays a big role in biographies. I myself didn't include it in, in, in cronyism <laughs> simply because it was kind of a, a side affair. Jackson was upset at Calhoun for that. Jackson was also upset, I believe, at Calhoun once he found out that Calhoun kind of double crossed him uh, regarding the his invasion of Florida. Yes. Uh, Jackson blew a gasket on that. Um, not really much you need to know about Peggy Eaton, though. I guess you could say Jackson was a feminist. Uh, he supported <laughs> Peggy Eaton. So when people demonize Jackson, they should know that. Peggy Eaton, uh, one of the things that kind of alienated her, I believe, from the Washington elite is she was speaking her mind and she was speaking about political mm -hmm. affairs. And this was something that women... Back then, they were, you know, you just weren't supposed to do that. The men, the men handle all of that. And Jackson always defended her because he 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 saw her. Uh, he saw Rachel, his uh, his 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 his, his uh, recently deceased wife, uh, I believe, in 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 uh, in Miss Eaton. And so, yeah, that kind of plays a, a a power, you know, a, a power struggle struggle role. It, it, it contributes to some of the differences. I, I don't think it's it's super important. It is one of those funny. Uh, li little things, but you know, you got to give Jackson credit. So, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's what, what, one of my favorite Rothbard quotes was something, uh, something along the facts that, you know, what, what other people consider gossip, he considered sociology. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, but I think there is some relevance here though, where again, something this trite, you know, this, in the grand scheme of things, very, very small, actually, you know, it, it, it plays, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it fuels some of these personal divides. Um, that end up having Graham, uh, you know, greater ramifications. So obviously, there's a lot more substantive reasons for disagreement. Um, but 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 this leads to Calhoun going from um, the vice presidency um, with, with with you know there, there's always that iconic sort of scene right where it's at the the height of the nullification crisis, and, and Calhoun is taking on this very strong South Carolina nationalist sort of of, of position of defending the right of nullification here and and. Uh, you know, Jackson has his toast, you know, in praising of the union. And then Calhoun has the slight about, you know, se you know, it's, you know how it's second only to liberty. And, and you know, this, this ends up this very tense sort of dynamic here. 
Um, but the, the background here, though, is the nullification crisis, which is a you know a, becomes a matter as you, as you highlight that not only do you have this intellectual push towards free trade and the recognition that there are certain moneyed interests that benefit from these protectionist tariffs, but you also have the dynamic that the you know, Jackson is succeeding at paying down the national debt. And once you get to that point where the national debt is extinguished, what do you do after that is, is sort of an open policy question. And so can you just you know, break down what was the significance of the nullification crisis um, and, and this larger battle over tariffs de- you know, that, that the Jackson administration faced? Yeah. So as, as you mentioned, the Jackson administration was committed to paying down the debt. OK, so this is something Andrew Jackson wanted to do since the 1820s. And of course, if you want to actually pay down the debt and not default or repudiate on it, those options had been lost to the annals of history ever since Jefferson and the Jefferson and the moderates got their way with Jefferson and not the old Republicans. Well, the only way you can do that is with uh, revenue from tariffs and land sales. Land sales were still uh, much smaller. Um, they, they didn't really start to rise significantly until the mid 1830s. So that was with tariff revenue. So Jackson didn't really want to lower tariffs until the debt was paid off. Some tariff decreases on some um, minor goods, miscellaneous goods, but he wanted to postpone free trade until that. All right. Now, in order to fully kind of understand what's going on with, regarding John Calhoun in South Carolina politics, you know, there's a bigger whole story about what exactly is going on regarding uh, South Carolina before uh, the, uh, the, the this whole tariff struggle and so on. South Carolina was previously a staunch federalist state, it was a staunch big government state. John C. Calhoun, uh, a lot of admirers might not admit it right now, but he was a big he was a proponent of big government throughout most of his career. Okay. He was a strong nationalist during the War of 1812. He was a nationalist while he was Secretary of War. He kind of changed his tune on protective tariffs in the mid 1820s because, one, he realized people in his state were becoming more and more free trade. Okay, because South Carolina uh, was exporting more and it was upset at higher tariffs. So he had people calling him out. He had uh, William Smith. He was a he was a, a congressman, um, a sort of an old Republican congressman. He was upset at Calhoun. More importantly, you had Thomas Cooper. He was this. Uh, he was a, a British economist. He was he was a professor uh, in South Carolina. He was criticizing protective tariffs, criticizing Calhoun's embrace of internal improvements, and so on. Calhoun's facing this pressure. Once Calhoun wins the vice presidency and the beginning of the Adams administration starts in 1825, he kind of changes. He recognizes the political wins. He recognizes he has to be much more outwardly small government. Uh, He has to be supporting lower tariffs and so on. Um, He needs to do this because Calhoun really wants the presidency. If 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 he wants the presidency, then he of course has to have his state behind his back. I view Calhoun very similar to how I view James Madison. They're kind of opportunists. They could talk a good talk. They weren't really dedicated proponents of small government. Calhoun wrote some nice documents, right? He wrote a disquisition on government. He wrote exposition and protest, et cetera. Both of those have to be sort of analyzed. Disquisition on government's great. That came much later. Exposition and protest relates to the nullification crisis. Uh, Even that's a little bit tempered. So by the time of the nullification crisis, and I know in this podcast, we've skipped the tariff of abominations and Van Buren's involvement in all of that. Uh, I can only say for people, uh, I got it in my book. I got the story there. So we kind of got to fast forward that, fast forward through that. South Carolinians are really upset at the 1828 tariff of abominations. Okay. Calhoun is feeling the heat. So what he does is he starts to uh, create this, ex- he drafts this exposition and protest, which basically comes up with this idea of nullification. All right. It was in uh, the ideas were basically implicit in the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Uh, you know, they, they, they were actually, you know, from there, uh, those anonymously written Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, really Thomas Jefferson's Kentucky resolution. Calhoun says, all right, if a state disagrees with the policy, then it can nullify the law. And then the federal government has to pass a constitutional amendment 
uh, basically, if, if they want to have South Carolina or another state uh, abide by this law, they have to pass a constitutional amendment, right? If they're able to do that, then the state has to either obey the law or secede. So this was Calhoun's kind of way of um, uh, recognizing uh, differences between uh, various states. So for Calhoun, a state that disagreed with the law had to call a state convention that would then decide whether to nullify the law, right? And that's what South Carolina uh, ended up doing regarding the tariff of 1832 uh, when that compromise was passed. Calhoun's exposition and protest is kind of weak in certain regards. Uh, Calhoun was, again, he was a big government nationalist. He had grounded his arguments in the Federalist Papers, which a lot of anti-Federalists uh, didn't like. He was um, uh, he still made nullification sort of, well, it was now contingent on an amendment. And he still, he actually didn't want secession. He wanted to put this whole complicated roadblock in front of secession because Calhoun still wanted to be president of the United States. OK, so rapidly um, this kind of becomes a new fighting ground, a battleground in, in South Carolina. A lot of old Republicans, uh, guys like uh, Nathaniel Macon, John Tyler, uh, Philip Barber, John Randolph, et cetera. They're kind of thinking like, what is Calhoun doing? We don't trust him. Uh, they didn't support what he was doing. Calhoun's big government supporters, guys like um, uh, uh, Mc George McDuffie and Robert Hayne, they become kind of the radicals in the state, while the South Carolina uh, previous supporters of limited government, they kind of switch to becoming unionists. They support secession, but they're saying Calhoun's whole document is, uh, is, is, is this weird little thing. So this is what Jackson is facing and once uh, the, the compromise tariff of 1832 is passed, South Carolina is unhappy with it, and rightfully so, because the Whigs in Congress had managed to delay and, and sort of keep protectionism afloat. South Carolinians, they adopt, um, uh, they, 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 they follow what Calhoun's doing, and they, they, they basically nullify the law, or they say they're going to nullify the law. So then this is the whole crisis that, uh, the, the, the nation faces. Okay. Jackson, this is arguably one of his worst ar parts of his, of his presidency because he does support lower tariffs, but he's, he's very upset at what Calhoun's doing. He thinks this whole secession idea is something you have to earn in military conflict. So Cal, uh, J Jackson basically says, look, I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to push for lower tariffs, but uh, you know, I, I will, I, you, you are not allowed to do this. I will hang you if I need to. Um, and, uh, I will not accept treason in South Carolina. All right. Admittedly a very bad position to take from an anti-crony perspective, but the important thing is that they got the job done. Okay. The Jacksonians in Congress, uh, at least the Van Burenites pushed for what was known as the Verplank bill lowering tariffs. And then due to a compromise between Clay and John Calhoun, which you can talk more about, as well as some other guys, uh, a tariff lowering rates over the next 10 years was passed. This is why free traders thought that Jackson had achieved a great victory. They didn't really focus on the force bill stuff so much. OK, uh, that only became more important when you get into the Civil War and the Southern Secession with all that stuff, et cetera. But the main thing is, even during this troubling time, the Jackson administration was still able to lower tariffs and a major push was coming from Van Buren and the New Yorkers, um, partially to compensate for the tariff of abominations. So that's kind of the the important basics, if you will, of this episode. Yeah, this seems to be, I think, one of the interesting conflicts here, right? Because we have identified ways that I, I love this larger conversation here about the virtues of that strong unilateral executive versus the the congressional sort of driven model, right? You know, it, it, what what is more in inclined to liberty? We've seen how the Jacksonian model provides very concrete victories, but you can't really reconcile a strong man leader with secession, right? You know. It, 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 you know whether it's Jackson or, or Caesar or Napoleon or any of those sort of figures, if, if you have this role where you, where you are, you, you create this, this personality cult that allows you to kind of restructure, you know, government 
you know, a, a corrupt government, a, a out of control government and bend it to your will. It is not within your personality to allow South Carolina to leave. <laughs> and it, it's difficult to reconcile those two because here you have on the economic side of things, this is great. But on the political side of things, obviously, the, the, the importance of political self-determination and the virtues of political central, uh, decentralization, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, I, I don't know how to, you know, th- this, this is to me the greatest failing of Jacksonians, you know, that, that, that's Jacksonian period. Uh, again, even though there wasn't, you know, the troops were not marched on South Carolina over this. Great. But, you know, th- this conflict is, is something that I, I don't know how to resolve internally. I just think it's really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is I, I I mentioned it in 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 my book that this is a, a weakness of the Jacksonians' reform through the executive branch is that when you're concentrating power uh, in in the executive branch to try and attack cronyism in other directions, of course, power tends to corrupt. Right? We we've, we've been through this time and time again ad nauseum. So Jackson's force bill and his. Uh, his, his basically attacks on um, South Carolina or his criticism of what they're doing, it, it looks like an, um, an imperial proclamation, okay? And this sort of portends maybe what James K. Polk is going to do during the Mexican War and his heavy-handed imperialist um, uh, it, it, uh, invasion of Mexico, Right. So this is it, 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 it's it's it, it's 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 something that every every strategy has a weakness. And this is ultimately the weakness of the Jacksonian executive strategy. But the important thing is that and, and this sometimes I think gets overlooked in this struggle for free trade, particularly regarding South Carolina, free trade during this time period was a broad-based movement. There was a Philadelphia Free Trade Convention, okay, before the compromise tariff was pushed for, of both free trade Southerners and free trade Northerners. Uh, You've got Albert Gallatin, he's there. You've got Philip Barber, he's there. Uh, You've got all of these economists who are um, influenced by uh, John Baptiste Say and Adam Smith, et cetera. So this, this was something that was going to be pushed through by the Jacksonians. South Carolina was kind of going through its own uh, political turmoil, and they were upset that tariffs weren't being lowered fast enough. Not belittling that complaint, because, uh, of course, this is, you know, by 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 not defaulting on the debt and using revenue to pay it off, you're getting pissed at people who are paying those taxes. Right. So that it is a valid complaint. But the, the Jacksonian coalition, including Van Buren, uh, the, or the Van Burenite supporters, et cetera, they were able to negotiate a crisis that really excuse me, negotiate a resolution to the crisis that lowered government, um, you know, lowered government involvement really in, in, in all, in, in, in all aspects, right? Because they were able to lower tariffs. All right. They were, so they were able to get a significant, um, decrease in tariffs over 10 years, not the two year decrease, the decrease in two years that, um, you know, the, the New Yorker supported they Jackson vetoed Henry Clay's distribution bill to distribute revenue to the States to kind of prolong tariff reduction. So Jackson's like, Nope, vetoing. And even the force bill uh, ended up, South Carolina said, no, we don't like this, but Jackson decided not to do anything about that. All right. So that's significant in itself. And it's, uh, this all happened, you know, right around the beginning of the, the, the second Jackson administration or the, the transition from the first to the second. And so the significance is that, you know, the, the, the move to free trade was going to be accomplished by the Jacksonians without South Carolina, but the South Carolina nullifiers um, did use a state's rights reform to sort of speed up this process more. Now, it could have caused a major constitutional crisis, but you now where's the fun in politics if, right. if, if, if it doesn't? So that's the way I look at it. I think that, um, well, maybe Jackson doesn't come out the best in this. The Jacksonians, uh, certainly, they, they still do succeed. It seems like it's almost necessary to have a a moment of political crisis in order to get anything significant done, right? And and, and here's a case of it being done in a, in a good way. Uh, usually, this goes in the the, the wrong way, uh, particularly after the 20th century. Um, but yeah, there is something to be said about the the virtues of of political crises. Um, and obviously, I, I, I you know what what's probably obvious to to our our 
viewers now, but you know, just should be made explicit, is that you know the, the the role of sectorial politics here, like these these sectional clashes, is really a, a major factor in shaping these political battles. Um, you know, John C. Calhoun is is you know kind of this Machiavellian figure. Um, you know, kind of you know, who's he's kind of ranking himself up. You know, he, he's trying to build himself up as one of the, the leaders in the, the Southern contingent. Um, you know, a, a you know Machiavellian counterpart would would be the aforementioned Henry Clay. Um, can you talk a little bit about like one of the things I think is interesting is you highlight all these ways that Clay is trying to undermine um, this this push towards reduction of tariffs. And, and I, I think it's interesting, only, you know, mainly in the way that this leads to, uh, I, I think, highlights a lot of political strategy that still goes over about today. Uh, like one of the things they tried to push was kind of delay, you know, g- giving a 10-year delay period for the, the gradual winding down of these reforms, which is often done as well. So if you want something not to get done at all, you, you, you kind of you know, bake it in to have this very long process there. We can always kind of you know, g- get Congress later on to delay and, and stop these sort of commonplace, you know, what's, what's sold as a very moderate, you know, sort of decline in, in rates and things like that. But also, can you talk a little bit about the strategy of and trying to do whatever you can to not reduce the levels of spending as a way of trying to maintain these tariffs? Because someone like Clay, he, he is explicitly, you know, th- there's a lot of motivation here to prevent you know, the, the, the lowering of prices through trade for very select industries that he benefits from, that, that, that other allies benefit from, right? So there very much is a, you know, they're, they're trying to use all these delay tactics in order to maintain the cronyism inherent within these industries that are the biggest benefactors of these protectionist tariffs. Yeah. So this is uh, this is a great. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this. this. is a great point because Clay's strategy. I mean, he's obviously a very shrewd individual. So Clay, you have to think of it from his perspective. Clay, um, he's now having to deal with Jackson, who's going to be president um, in you know the first administration from 1829 to 1833, and then especially after Jackson just totally you know he, he smashes Clay in the 1832 election. Clay realizes that okay. I uh, got to go to the drawing board. The Whigs realized that now instead of adding on more to their American system as they were doing in the 1820s, they're now going to have to try to protect it in, in what way they can. And sometimes uh, if you can only save 50 percent of a sinking ship, then, you know, that's that's just your best option. So Clay realized that people were coming down on the protective tariff. So he was trying to do everything in his can to defend the tariff, because for Clay, that was a huge linchpin of the American system. Without that protective tariff, the, a lot of the other planks fall apart. You're not going to be able to stimulate manufacturing at the expense of the other sectors. You're not going to be able to raise uh, revenue to fund a system of internal improvements, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, because then we can get into whole Clay's foreign policy stuff and how that relates to the protective tariff. So Clay was one, he was going to argue for lowering tariffs. He would argue for lowering tariffs on non uh, goods that weren't produced in America, right? So they weren't really protective tariffs at all. So he was going to say, oh, we could lower those like tariffs on coffee or tea or things like that. It wasn't iron and steel and and, 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 and traditional uh, manufactured products. Clay was also arguing for this distribution system. So he's saying, okay, Congress is not willing to embark upon uh, its its own uh, program of federal, uh, of its own federal program of internal improvements because of the Maysville Road veto and some other stuff that maybe, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about in the near future. Um, and he said, oh, okay, well, why don't we just distribute it to the states? This is something that Calhoun also had expressed support for. And this idea, this is a really this is a really good strategy because Clay basically said, in order to justify these tax, uh, these, these, these high taxes, we have to spend money. We have to spend money. <laughs> and and so um, he was saying, well, why don't we distribute to the states? Now we're going to create a vested interest group. The states want money from the federal government, right? So they're going to support policies that strengthen the federal government. This is something that happens a lot now. This is the only way we were able to get states to raise the drinking age. Well, Congress said they'd cut off their highway funds. 
Okay, this is also a strategy Republicans in the post-Civil War uh, era did in order to defend the protective tariff. They said, "Okay, we're going to support um, instances where they're going to support programs that increase government spending, such as increased payments to veterans." Right. This is a way of justifying the high tariff. So Clay is trying to do this. He's trying to uh, prolong the tariff. He's saying, well, we're going to only institute cuts now. Now they're going to be spread out over 10 years. OK. And this, again, is, is delaying the pain. And maybe the maybe the Whigs will be able to um, win control of the government before then and, and change the policy or Right when the tariffs are scheduled to end in 1842, then uh, then they can just start raising them again, which is actually what they tried to do. So Clay's strategy is to try to prevent the Jacksonians from destroying the American system right now. And it's a smart strategy. But uh, unfortunately for Clay and fortunately for uh, opponents of cronyism and reformers, it's just not good enough. There aren't enough people behind uh, the policy, and Clay has to watch his precious protective tariffs, um, you know, get destroyed. He's not able to protect his protective tariffs, <laughs> in other words. Uh, can you just briefly also touch on, you know, kind of the Jackson or the Jefferson? Or, sorry, the Jacksonian pushback was trying to create a southern western sort of alliance here on trying to break through some of the schism. Uh, uh, Senator uh, Thomas Hart Benton proposes his own dynamic, um, trying to uh, lower land prices. I, just, I, th I think just kind of interesting within some of the gamesmanship involved. Can you just touch on briefly um, the attempts there by the Jacksonian side um, to to offer a, a different sort of sectional alliance that that would have provided perhaps greater strength in some of these moves? I, I know you love any chance we can to, to talk about uh, Senator Thomas Hart Benton. Yeah. So I, I think that I think I, I, I love Thomas Hart Benton because he's uh, an interesting character in the Jacksonian coalition who always, always, doesn't always get discussed so much or mentioned. There there was a Rothbard review of a uh, of a of a history book um, in the early 60s when Rothbard was criticizing it. And he said, well, they don't even mention Thomas Hart old bullion Benton as if like, this is like, oh, how this Outrage. is a worthless history book. If you don't mention uh, Thomas Hart Benton. And of course he's, he's a great Jacksonian. He's a rugged man like Jackson himself. Uh, he actually previously fought Jackson in a duel and he shot him in the arm. And then uh, they later uh, made, you know, they, 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 they later became great, great, great friends. And Benton was a prominent Senator from Missouri who uh, was a staunch Jacksonian in the upper chamber. So Henry Clay's American system was sort of billed as a way uh, of, of allying the North with the West. Okay, so Clay argued that the West was more similar to the North or the in order to really pass these programs that benefit the North, you had to enlist the West because the South wasn't going to support protective tariffs come hell or high water. So then uh, Clay says, well, we're going to have to you know, bring, it, bring the West into this argument. So Clay was saying, well, protective tariffs are going to benefit North. They're also going to benefit some Western industries. But more importantly, uh, they're going to raise revenue that, and this is the key point, combined with high prices of Western lands, right, the revenue that Congress would get from selling land at high prices, both of these things uh, are going to provide enough money to fund internal improvements that will benefit the West. Okay, so this was sort of the agreement Clay was trying to uh, propose to the West. We're saying, look, the American system is actually going to benefit you guys. So Thomas Hart Benton's a Jacksonian from Missouri. Missouri at the time is basically the West. Okay, it's 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 the, it's the frontier of the country more or less in terms of states. And Thomas Hart Benton was a man who was who was promo who, who supported internal improvements. Okay, he was a Westerner. He was, uh, you know, he supported uh, low tariffs. Um, he also was very anti-bank, but that was kind of his one weakness: internal improvements. But starting in the late 1820s, Benton realized that hey, wait a second, this American system actually isn't going to benefit the West because while the protective tariffs uh, would fund internal improvements that benefited the West. Uh, he, Clay also needed high uh, prices for Western lands. And this was something that would hurt the West. Benton was staunchly supportive of very low prices for Western lands, basically allowing homesteaders to get them, which is a very Rothbardian position. So what Benton said is, okay, why don't instead of why don't we try a Southwest alliance? So 
I can get the West to support the Southerners' demands for free trade if Southerners support the West's demand for uh, low land prices. And then both of these will be able to block internal improvements. So what Benton is saying is, look, I will give up support for internal improvements if you if if, if Southerners support uh, low land prices. That was sort of his, 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 his agreement, which I think is very interesting. And it's important to look at because usually you make a coalition by saying, look, I'll support your special interest policy. If you support my special interest policy, what Ben was actually doing is look, I'll help you fight your hated special interest policy. If you help us fight our hated special interest policies, they weren't looking to you know, do a quid pro quo regarding special interest policies. They were looking to both, you know, the, the Benton and his supporters were looking to attack uh, special interest policies. So he was pushing for this Southwest Alliance. I think it was a great idea. Unfortunately, the South, particularly the Southeast, including South Carolina and basically the coast, uh, the, the the rest of the 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 you know, the 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 the, the uh, this North Carolina, uh, Georgia, Virginia, etc. They were reluctant to lower land prices because they wanted lower land prices to pay off the debt. So uh, they wanted to focus more on protective tariffs. And this was kind of the big stumbling block because without the lower land prices, Benton wasn't going to give up the support for the internal improvements. And so this is something I really wish it worked. Uh, because um, the Jacksonians did fight internal improvements, okay, and they also fought um, uh, protective tariffs. They weren't as successful in lowering land prices, okay. Um, and this was kind of a, a stumbling block. It's unfortunate; nothing's perfect, but they couldn't get to that. I, I give uh, Thomas Hart Benton uh, major props for trying. Okay. Um some of the other successes of the era. Uh, I, I loved when they, uh, Jackson vetoes a, uh, a road that would have directly benefited Henry Clay, um, which itself kind of reflecting uh, uh, some changes there. And you, you highlight, um, I don't need to go, go too deep into it, but you know, there's, there's this move towards more state-driven uh, uh, you know, you know, leadership on the internal improvement side of things. But, but unfortunately, in spite of some of these suggestions at the margins, you highlight how the actual physical record of the Jacksonian era is a bit of a mixed bag, um, even though the national debt is phased out, um, which allows for these free trade conversations. Um, spending itself actually incre does increase. Um, and so can you just talk a little bit about some of the downfalls here, um, which includes, you know, good old you know election year sort of spending and as well as uh, military spending with the Second Seminole War, things like that. You know, here, here are some trappings that we continue to have. Um, yeah, where, where it's, it's, it continues to be easy to justify spending in spite of the fact that you have a, a very strong, uh, you know, circle around here that, that understands the benefits of reducing, uh, you know, public spending for in the, the larger benefits here. It's still difficult to kind of get away from that, uh, that yeah. sin of government. Yeah, so the spending, Jackson was successful. Jackson, the president, was successful, at least his administration, in paying off the debt, less successful in controlling spending. Overall, though, uh, at least by the Polk administration, uh, the debt and spending were on downward trajectories before the Mexican War. So at least in that regard, you know, overall, they were much more successful on the spending issue than Jackson per se. Jackson's strategy, really the initial Jacksonian strategy and something that James K. Polk also pursued, was again, reform has to begin with the executive. So why don't we use this presidential veto and start vetoing Congress's internal improvement legislation? The Maysville uh, Road veto, um, of May 1830 was actually the Jacksonians, Jackson's first real use of the presidential veto that transformed it. It came before the bank veto, um, the bank bill veto in 1832. And so Jackson's strategy was, okay, I'm going to control internal improvement spending by vetoing things. Uh, unfortunately, it, it, it worked for a little bit, but at the end of his term, uh, spending started to go up. Uh, as well as internal improvement spending, one, because some of it was just hidden in general bills mm -hmm. that was very hard for Jackson to detect. It's something uh, that's still done today, right? All, all these little things that you just kind of add in to a must-pass bill and you can get away with uh, just about anything you want. Exactly. You know, the, 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 the little things in there. Um, 
Jackson, you know, certain internal improvement projects he was supportive of. Uh, then you had a huge increase in military spending during the Second Seminole War. Then there was the issue of elections uh, in 1832 and 1836. The Jacksonians were incentivized to push for pork to benefit themselves uh, during the election. This is kind of that corruption issue. Uh, but you know, after the Jacksonian term, after Jackson's, uh, you know, the, the, the first uh, the, uh, the the first presidency of the Jacksonians, so Andrew Jackson, um, the you started to see those more frugal, uh, you know, scruples being pushed for. The Panic of 1837 was a big jolt, uh, really energized the Jacksonians into cutting government spending. A lot of state internal improvement projects had not worked out. Jacksonians realized that, hey, wait a second. Corporate charters combined with government subsidies, that's a recipe for cronyism. It's a recipe for disaster. So Jacksonians, they're supporting general incorporation laws uh, on the state level, getting rid of the chartering system. And in the new state constitutions, they're supportive of, and I think this is very important, they're supportive of restricting states' abilities to invest in uh, internal improvements or to lend money to companies or to invest in companies purchasing their stock, uh, et cetera, right? So to try and separate the government from um, uh, getting involved in businesses. Now, as the 1850s uh, showed, uh, there were loopholes, particularly regarding uh, giving land or having the federal government give land to states that they can then give to companies, and but that's a whole different story. But the Jacksonians, they at the state level and the federal level, uh, after the Panic of 1837, they were really good at fighting uh, government spending and continuing to pay off the debt. Okay, the uh, Van Buren was good on this. He was very frugal. Uh, so was John Tyler for the most part. And then before the Mexican War, uh, Polk was very good on this. And Polk, uh, his famous veto was this Rivers and Harbors veto bill. Uh, excuse me, this Rivers and Harbor bill that he vetoed that was supposed to benefit the West. And he vetoed that. So the Jacksonians, initially, they they weren't as successful in reigning in government spending, but they still were able to get the job done, which I think is uh, admirable. And it shows you that, again, it might take several presidential administrations, but if you're slowly chipping away and you've got your eyes on the prize, so to speak, and you don't get distracted, uh, you'll be able to make progress. OK, and this is the Jacksonians. Yes. Yeah, so they were they were successful in this regard. I do think a big thing was uh, obviously re regarding any of this. Henry, William Henry Harrison, he was a Whig. He won in 1840, but he died. And you pretty much had an ex Jacksonian John Tyler running the show, who, although split with Andrew Jackson over executive power, all of his greatest policies from a libertarian anti crony perspective were basically just presidential vetoes. So he was kind of doing the Jacksonian strategy. Right. So it was just four presidencies of the Jacksonian strategy uh, reformed through the executive. And I think that's really important. It's successful with central banking, successful with protective tariffs, and it is successful with government spending and internal improvements. And of course, one last uh, point to end on. Um, there is also a major change within the Supreme Court at this time with the passing of our, our dearly beloved John Marshall. Um, which uh, you know, changes, it gives Jackson the ability to, to have a, a great impact on the Supreme Court, um, since John Marshall, who was a benefactor of a lot of this cronyism in the past, um, it now gets to be replaced by a Jacksonian judge. Can you just touch a little bit about the significance of that on some of these things from a judicial perspective going forward? Yeah, so uh, uh, Chief Justice Marshall, he finally kicks the bucket in 1835. You know, it was a long time coming. Um, and so Jackson, uh, he wasn't a he wasn't a huge fan of John Marshall for for various reasons. Um, but so Jackson says, all right, I'm finally going to change the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, if you remember, since the Adams administration, uh, the tail end of the Adams administration, it's it's like a Federalist stronghold. That's where the Federalists were able to survive after getting kicked out of the presidency and Congress. They were able to survive in the Supreme Court. Jefferson didn't really reform the Supreme Court or appoint people that could uh, fight John Marshall. Uh, so John Marshall was able to exercise his uh, his, his, his dominance over this institution, uh, for, for many decades. And so the Jacksonians wanted to, um, you know, of course, chip away at the Supreme court. So once Marshall dies, Andrew Jackson 
is then uh, he, he basically appoints Tawny uh, and Philip Barber to the Supreme Court. And both of them are sort of hardcore old Republican Jacksonian Democrats, especially Philip Barber. Uh, Tawny had some controversial decisions later on in his career, notably Judd Scott. But he, he was an excellent Jacksonian judge uh, early on. And so a famous case was the Charles River Bridge versus the Warren Bridge case where basically the Jacksonian Supreme Court said that um, you know, the, the, uh, the states have a right to, to rescind corporate charters or to revise them. So if they give, if one uh, current legislator gives a charter basically a monopoly, that doesn't mean that it's protected through all time from the contract clause, which is what uh, uh, John Marshall and even Hamilton, they argued uh, earlier on regarding the Yazoo land scandal. So this was a big moment uh, because it sort of shifted the Supreme Court away from being a big government body to becoming one much more appreciative of states' rights. OK, and so this was the the uh, a major reform that deserves uh, proper appreciation because it did uh, change the judiciary, at least for a little bit. Yeah, that, that old uh, Yazoo land scandal. Just keeps oh, the up. Yazoo lands. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, now that we have seen again some of the the uh, the great triumphs and some of the uh, uh, parts of moderation of the Jacksonian era. Uh, next week's episode, we're going to go into some of the more failings and, and what what kind of the, the decline of the Jacksonian tradition later on. But uh, this has been a, a one of my favorite topics. And I think there's a tremendous amount that we can learn from this, particularly for those interested in you know radical economic change, which is what we had here, uh, both ideologically and through this extension in terms of policy. Uh, so any other things that you want to wrap up here, Patrick, before we get out of here? Uh, yeah, just to kind of build off of what you were saying before that, you know, one of the main reasons why we look at history is so we could learn from it and how to reform the present. So when you're thinking about, OK, how uh, could we possibly try and change the Leviathan government we have today or try to get reforms done? Well, one way in which we can look at all right, is this possible, is well, what did people do in the past and when they succeeded? And I think there's a lot to learn from the Jacksonians that uh, a, a lot of strategy and tactics that they uh, practice that we don't really know about now. And that's all, uh, that's, that's why it's important to have uh, you know, this podcast, we're able to talk about it uh, because, uh, yeah, the, the Jacksonians, they it might, might, be, might be our only hope but for, for, for the years ahead. Because yeah. here is a concrete example of against so many of the arguments against Republican government and, and democracy at whole, right? It's so easy to bribe your way into future elections. And again, there's a little bit of that here with some of the, the political machinations. But here is an example, you know, perhaps one of the better examples out there within history of a laissez-faire republic. And again, it's not perfect. There's a lot of issues there. A lot of things, you know, all needs to be said. But again, if you're looking at what is a government that actually functions the way we kind of want it to, Here's some example, and I, you know, I, I think this is again one of my favorite parts of the book. And if you have, do not have your copy of Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in America, what are you doing? Why are you listening? Uh, you go, go, go! Turn in that that coupon code. Please rate, review, share, get the word out. Um, get, thank you for all the feedback we have delivered. And uh, this has been a, another episode of Liberty versus Power podcast. Until next time, this is Though Bishop Patrick Newman. Oh, oh, uh, Tommy, Tommy, what are you, what are you saying?